Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christy Ballier. Thank you for joining us today for the format series as part of the graduate thesis program. The lecture series is organized by graduate chair Elena Manfredini, and the theme this summer is Expanding the Archives, a lecture series centered around the theme of the archive. Today, I am pleased to welcome and introduce Ari Work, who will offer a lecture entitled Ancientness and Future Forms of Coexistence. Work's work will explore a contemporary position on what has traditionally been called our relationship to nature, discussing new aesthetic and spatial possibilities of an ecocentric architecture. Barry is an architect and designer based in London who combines practice with research and teaching activities at the Bartlett School of Architecture, UCL. Barry is also the co-founder of Academic Atelier BioFile, a space for students and educators to contribute to the evolving nature architecture dialogue. In his own words, the design work rejects that humans and their artifacts are impervious or separate to the natural world. Instead, explores permissible forms of coexistence between human and non-humans within the built environment. The work crosses over to other disciplines such as films and game developers. I see the impact of the work broadening through active dialogues with contemporary practices and a heavy reference and admiration by many students. The projects engage a diverse set of topics and regions, including flood towers in India, tenement housing proposals in Scotland, to a speculative series entitled Lost Monuments. While all the work is striking, in terms of the concept of the archive, the monuments seem to blur time. What I love about the work overall is that it makes a request for you to slow down. It is rendered with materials from long ago, but soon, begin, but soon you begin to question the age of the artifact, the technology engaged, and the aesthetics produced. The objects are ambiguous and challenge our notion of time and by connection, the archive. Thank you, Barry. I look forward to your lecture today. Thanks, thanks so much. Um for that introduction uh, and for reading so many things uh, in the work. Um, I'm just going to share my screen, just bear with me a second. Yeah, so, so first and foremost, um, thank you so much to the school for the, the invitation. Um, it's great to be able to kind of talk to people in LA from my uh, kind of humble office here here at home just outside of London um, and thanks so much for for that introduction it really kind of sets the tone for exactly what I'm going to talk about um, in the lecture what I'm going to do is I'm going to very quickly show a couple of things that I do at the Bartlett then I'm going to kind of give a very quick framework to the ideas that kind of underpin all the things that I'm exploring then what I'm going to do is just quickly show a little bit about my methodology and thinking just based upon the kind of context of it being for graduate students then i'll show a few projects um, and then hopefully at the end we'll have lots of time for uh questions and discussion which is somehow the thing that i always enjoy the most so i'm a lecturer at the bartlett school of architecture um, and i have teaching and research roles there uh, one of the things that i do is i run an undergraduate unit um, and we work with the students to develop projects that are based upon biophilic design theory. We normally try and work um, in biomes that don't have a kind of intense vegetative growth. And we try and create architecture that engages with those biomes. But ultimately what we try and do is we try and speculate on climate change. And we sort of think about what the effects of that might be in the social political context of the city and we propose buildings that engage with the potential futures of that. Um, another role that I have is um, that I read lead design research on the Bartlett uh, B Pro AD course um, and in this in this course we work with students to speculate on how novel technology and, and computation can progress architecture so this can encompass things like fabrication and material research, which you can see in some of these images. But also this year we're working on some research into machine learning, and we're trying to use these tools to create our own data sets that are embedded with ecological and biological intelligence. And we're trying to think about new ways to develop architecture beyond simply the authorship 
of the designer. So these are some of the things that we're going to be exploring um, this week. And if you guys have time, you should come to the BPO review reviews that we have on the next uh, three days. So here we're working with a drawing tool. Um, and we're trying to draw simultaneously human and non-human spaces. So it's all trying to think about how computation can sort of dissolve purely anthropocentric intentions when we, when we design. Um, today, the talk that I'm going to give is my response and contribution to the ongoing discourse around um, ecology and aesthetics. So what, what should the role of architecture be to, to mitigate the negative impact of anthropogenic change on the planet? You know, there's a lot of focus around technology and, and materials, and that's incredibly valuable work. But what I want to argue is that this needs to be accompanied with a massive shift in our worldview. And in that regard, I'm interested in architecture's ability to generate new spaces and aesthetics and also to consider how these spaces and aesthetics can impact us and help us develop new sensibilities. So firstly, I'm really sorry for the cheesy kind of infographics, um, <laughs> but I haven't found anything better yet. Um, but, what, but what I want to argue for is that we need to shift the worldview from anthropocentrism to ecocentrism. In other words, we, we kind of need to get past our own self of self-importance and that we and our artifacts, in this case, in the context of this, this kind of talk, our buildings, are not more important and don't exist above and beyond all the things on the planet. And for many of you in this school, particularly uh, like at SciArc, you'll find a lot of the parallels with ecocentrism and triple O, basically arguing kind of for a sort of flat ontology of objects. I find it extremely interesting that we are still dominated by anthropocentrism in our view, because through technology, the way that we understand the world is fundamentally changed. We know that the biosphere is comprised of complex and interconnected systems, and things operating over extremely large temporal and spatial scales. And this is what Timothy Morton refers to as hyperobjects. They're sort of things that exist so far beyond our perception of the world that it's incredibly hard for us to think about them and how we relate to them and exist within them. But it is possible still, even though we don't fully understand them all the time, that we can still have moments where we kind of promote ecocentric thought. So these two drawings for me are extremely accessible and really great examples. On the left, we have a cartoon by Tom Gould that's actually from Hyperobjects, or it's in Hyperobjects, where we have two rocks having a conversation. And through the, the course of the very casual conversation, humanity appears on the Earth, becomes incredibly advanced, and then disappears again. And we sort of know that one day that will happen. <laughs> um, and then on the right, we have a diagram where we see how the tectonic plates of the Earth have moved over time to create new con continents and continents disappear. So for us, uh, the idea of Italy or England, for us might seem incredibly permanent and incredibly fixed right now, but within the context of hyper objects, it's, it's something very temporal. And so it is possible for us to visualize and think about these types of things, but we would expect that this awareness would have dismantled the prevalence of anthropocentrism and we would imagine that somehow it would have brought forth a kind of new architectural sensibility of ecology. Now, what we have that's a bit of a challenge is we're really, really struggling in architecture to move past this like nature architecture dialogue. We use nature as this cultural construct. That's a term that's used to, sum, to, to summarize everything that exists outside of us and our artifacts and, and create a distance. But we know that that distance doesn't exist and that nature is not something that exists beyond the boundaries of our cities. There are no boundaries in terms of ecology. 
And the problem that we have here is that a lot of this kind of language, not only verbal, but also kind of architectural language, it's been used as an anesthesia that somehow if we have plants on our facades that we're dealing with the environmental crisis. But what all it's doing is it's, it's kind of promoting this idea of control and distance between us and the artifact that we're producing. So what I'm striving for in my work um, is the creation of what I would call a humble artifact. So what I mean by that is that its qualities emerge not from a controlled and highly maintained external planting, but from the effect of the artifact's interconnectedness with non-humans, with atmosphere, with weather. And that this artifact should encourage and acknowledge the ubiquitous presence of non-humans in our built environments, regardless of our ontological claims. Now, the consequence of dissolving this distance between us and all the other things in the planet, it could at times be quite disturbing and even quite eerie. And if we're going to use this power of spatial experience that we have as architects to promote ecocentric thoughts, then we need to strive to develop conditions of comfort with the uncomfortable. So we can see in these two images that ultimately the same effects are at play. On the left hand side, we might even deem this quite beautiful with sort of with mosses and patina, which is a nice way to talk about degradation. But then when we see that on the interior in these two beds, somehow it unsettles us so deeply that we're going to reject that. So within this work, there's a real sort of effort to find territory in which we will not reject that collapse of the distance of nature. So ancientness. Um, the first thing to say is that within the, the context of ecology and hyperobjects, like there are there is no ancient architecture. There's only structures displaying various levels of their natural state. So why is this interesting? Like why would we talk about ancientness in regard to ecology? Well, when we think about architecture over these larger time scales. We might think about ancient civilizations whose buildings have fallen into ruin. And when we experience these structures, it can make us consider our own mortality. It can make us think about the kind of vulnerability of architecture and by extension, our own human condition. And I think that this really challenges our notions of control and imperviousness that's been promoted through anthropocentrism. Ruins destabilize the human sense of privilege, and they could offer fertile ground for promoting ecocentric thought. Throughout history, we've manipulated the appearance of our ancient structures, and we've created conditions of monument from conditions of ruin. So the Colosseum in Rome was once one of the most fantastic botanical gardens in the world, as all the seeds of the animals and the gladiators that had been brought there became lodged in the structures. Um, and these were subsequently removed. We also removed the jungle from the Mesoamerican pyramids and we dug out the structures at Giza. Regardless of the motivations of these acts, the last and subconscious result was that these artifacts were in some sense impervious to the natural world and that the history of the reconstruction is pretty much forgotten. I mean, it's, it's quite a really known fact that Stonehenge in fact has uh, concrete foundations <laughs> and was entirely reconstructed. Um, but yet, here we go. All that being said, there is still a general acceptance that ancient buildings will show signs of degradation and that there's a comfort with the presence of non-humans within and upon ancient architecture. So that for me is a starting point to go into things. This desire to erase the kind of natural state of buildings is not reserved just for lost civilizations, and it's still prevalent in contemporary culture. Villa Savoir by uh, Le Corbusier embodied his claims for a modernist architecture, elevated and separate from nature. And this is an ideology that still dominates our relationship with non-humans today. 
ironically, <laughs> for all the claims for the architecture, it didn't stop the building from falling into relative ruin within 10 years of its completion, acting as a hay store, amongst other things, before its refurbishment in the 80s. Unsurprisingly, we, we struggle to accept images of modernist or later architectural styles as ruins. As Jonathan Hill outlines in his books, The Ruin of Architecture, ruin produces a kind of comfort that the collapse happened in the past. However, when we observe the same exact same conditions on a building we conceive to be contemporary, it collapses the distance and it unsettles us and it makes, it, it makes us consider a more imminent demise. So what these kind of ideas indicate towards and what I'm arguing for is that permissibility and comfort with non-human and atmospheric effect upon structures is normally defined by its age or how, we, how old we perceive it to be. So what I'm trying to speculate upon is that artifacts that produce or have qualities of temporal ambiguity or new ancientness would raise questions about this permissiveness. So this is why the, the thing is ancient. So I'm not actually arguing for ancient in terms of like ancient construction. But what I'm arguing for is that these qualities could allow us to shorten that distance of nature towards an aesthetics of ecology and not reject it. So the next thing that I want to talk about within this conversation is parts. Conceiving a building as an assembly of parts rather than a defined whole promotes an openness to the building's identity. And what we start to do is anticipate that parts will be added or removed, and this can in turn spark an imagination. It introduces new spatial possibilities where some areas may have qualities of degradation with others newly constructed. Thus, adjacent parts within the same assembly could have distinctly different temporal legibility. This could further act as a destabilization tool as we begin to question the age of the structure and the acceptance of its natural state. So in this instance, a part space architecture could be perceived as both under construction and ruination simultaneously. So it's looking to the future as well as the past. And what this elastic temporality could do is it could transform the association of ruins with death, with a single direction towards death. And it could create a sense of regeneration of both the artifact, but also the non-humans within and upon that structure. Working with parts has further important benefits. Um, as it encourages opportunities for passive plant propagation. The urban cliff hypothesis is by T.J. Lundholm, and he's a kind of a biologist. And what he states is that cities and cliffs have the exact same habitat template. They both have very soil and rooting space, and they go from very wet to very dry. But yet in both, plants will grow in the gaps of the structures, basically the areas where moisture is retained. And many older and ancient structures are built with parts, and they're comprised of quite open seams, natural materials with good pH levels, and these are optimal for plant growth, and it explains why left unmaintained are readily colonized by plants. So um, <laughs> what we could do as designers is we could actively design the gaps and the fissures between the parts themselves. So the architect could basically become a designer of this urban cliff condition of where these things exist and, and why. So it's not trying to create a kind of like highly maintained, perfect, sweet green facade, but what it's doing is it's creating potential for growth and potential for these things to take hold. So that was the kind of some of the basic ideas that underpin the work. And what I'm going to do now is just go in slightly to some of the design 
methodology. Um, and like I say, I'm showing this because of the context of the lecture and it's for, for kind of grad students. And what I would really encourage all you guys to do is to design and propose as you think through your work. Um, for me personally, I started with more of a biological aesthetic of this work, but through reading and writing and designing, it really evolved. But I always enjoyed producing these small models. They were somehow more than a sketch, but less arduous than designing a full building. And I think it's a territory where personally, I really move through my ideas the most. So as I mentioned, um, I started with a kind of more biological model. <laughs> I think it was part of the times. Um, and now I'm trying to create objects that have attention and an ambiguity. They're, they're trying to suspend consumption as something natural or artifactual. And it explores the notion of the kind of textual mass in the megalith, implying deep fissures, hidden depths, and somehow that there's spaces within these objects that are withdrawn from human access. These experiments are trying to build on that and, and work with what we might call human geometries. So these are things such as like linear repetitions, orthogonal datums, vertical surface and aperture. And the ambition here is to, is to sort of question the age of these objects. And I'm always trying to speculate on whether it would be rejected or accepted if it would become totally degraded over time. Something else that I'm always trying to work on and do in these is the micro details of the structures. Um, and I'm thinking about slopes, slowing down water runoff, and creating these micro textures to trap seeds and dirt and propagate non-human nature based upon this urban cliff hypothesis. So it's almost trying to think about the world at the micro as well as the kind of macro scale. And over time, these ideas build up and build up, where I then start to produce these kind of humble artifacts, where arguably they're more beautiful when they display their, their natural human nature uh, upon them. And I'm always trying to tiptoe this line between a legibility of something manufactured or something grown is it this original state? Is this sort of created through deposition or is it through erosion? And somehow all these qualities are present simultaneously within, within the object. And sometimes I might just very quickly extrapolate this out into a kind of small space where I can kind of inhabit that as a kind of um, spatial condition as well. So moving on from that, I'm just going to go over um, some of the projects now. So the first one's called um, Grotto Facade. And this is something that I've been entirely uh, like preoccupied with for, for a while now, um, because I think it's a space that we already know. And it sits on the threshold between the garden and the, the building. And it's intentionally designed to degrade and to melt into the landscape. So it already has this kind of permissiveness within that for displaying its natural state. Um, I was going through a point where I was extremely <laughs> sort of fascinated by goggets, which are these natural min mineral formations. And somehow, even though it's entirely natural, it has this kind of artifactual order to it that I found really interesting. So I wanted to kind of extrapolate these qualities into something spatial. So here, the, 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 the proposal wanted to create this kind of like voluptuous grotto inspired um, by some of the, the presidents I was looking at, that had spaces for humans, some for non-humans, and some that were ambiguous, that would maybe change over time. So here you can see the sort of the front elevation and then two sections through this, where we have a clear sort of inside and outside zone. Poche. And I think what's not always clear is what Poche is inhabited by humans or designed for humans and which is not. And I think that for me, that's interesting because what you have starts to happen is as you navigate through the spaces, you as an inhabitant are questioning if that's a space for you or not. And everyone is appropriating to their own comfort levels within and around that structure. This is the detail at the top where 
probably not for humans because they couldn't climb in there. But it's about dedicating these areas within the architecture, within the poche that, that is for our imagination to, to sort of look at and to challenge us within, within the kind of built environment. This project is for the Glasgow School of Art. Um, for those of you who don't know the building, um, it's an art school in Glasgow that was designed by Charles Rennie Macintosh. Um, it was really sad for me, actually, but I had a small fire in 2014 where the library was destroyed. And then there was a more significant one in 2018. Um, and you can see from these images that the building and the entire block were very, very badly damaged by the fire. Um, and the original building is frankly no more than a husk. There's not much to uh, salvage. So I wanted to kind of offer a provocation and a vision for the site. And um, it would hopefully act as a catalyst for the regeneration of this block in Glasgow beyond just accepting a kind of pastiche re rehash of the, the building. So the first thing that I wanted to do was to leave the original building as a ruin and hollow it out. And this would create a new public space that the city desperately the second thing I wanted to do was to append that with new studio spaces. And I wanted to create this tension in the age between which built, which part was older or newer. And through this temporal ambiguity, accept that the building was becoming degraded and overgrown with plants over time. And ultimately, I wanted to challenge this kind of conservationist attitude that things should last forever and buildings should last forever because they don't. They go on fire, they need rebuilt, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanted to kind of also make a comment on that to be brave and, and move forward somehow into the future. <laughs> I was really inspired by the material and ornamental qualities um, of traditional Glaswegian architecture, and especially how upon close inspection, you can really see this urban cliff hypothesis taking hold for all the reasons that I mentioned before. So the atrium space that, that was in the existing building becomes exposed. It's reinforced with new elements that, that, that strengthen and protect what's left of the facade and simultaneously provide seams and gaps and this kind of textural mass on the inside for plant propagation. And then moving outside, the extension doesn't try to mimic or define itself by its relationship to the existing building, but, is, but it instead possesses its own qualities and, and sort of its own legibility. And you can see that this is kind of extrapolated from these models where I have some linear elements, some datums, and it really tries to operate between this natural and artifactual. Here we see it from the, the bottom of the hill, as it's starting to become stained and overgrown with vegetation. And it's not immediately obvious how deep this building is, what its program is, and what it's trying to do is play with a sort of notion of like the allure and maybe even something that's a little bit haunting. And that's, I really wanted to work with this territory in the project um, of the uncanny. So in Glasgow, you get this really particular condition where because it's a grid city, you never really see a true elevation of the project. And so the buildings appear solid and, and megalithic. So here we get that same sense of the architecture, but by breaking down the kind of classicism, it starts to operate in that uncanny territory where we have these kind of perforations that suggest windows, but maybe they're not. This is the side entrance to the project. So you can see it has this kind of allure through this like unknown depth of the project. At some moments, it kind of pops up flat where we see these moments of glazing and others that becomes uh, recessed through. We get light down into here through, through two atriums that's with inside that mass. And um, one thing that was really important to me in the project was that I really wanted to kind of publish the work outside of architecture because that's when you always get the best feedback. And some of the comments are quite silly and you, know, you can have a laugh about it. But one guy wrote one of the, the best uh, critiques of the work that I've ever had. <laughs> he says, 
This fills me with extreme dread and activates my fight and flight mechanism. Terrible things happen in there. It's ever shifting and it's nothing but evil intentions. I have heard of people getting swallowed by its monstrous tumoral facade and never being seen again. Its aura permeates the city like a poison. I feel unsafe just looking at it. And, um, <laughs> and I think for me, it's like, he somehow managed to summarize much better than I could a, a sensibility of the ecological. And whether or not he had that reading or that type of, um, you know, that type of sensibility, ultimately there is a darkness and, and a bit of discomfort in that shortening. So when we start to create planting and these kind of ancientness, it's not the sweetness that you get from greenwashing. It's it's something else. So I think in from one that one person's feedback alone, I was like super happy. The Glasgow School of Art haven't asked me to build this yet, but there's still time. So the 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 next project is called By the Sea. Not very imaginative. But what it tries to do is to, is to challenge what I call the kind of like the audacity of the White House. And we have this, this kind of habit of when we place a building right on the coast, we always paint it white. <laughs> and I don't know if that's to make us feel better, that we're somehow going to be OK next to the sea. But it's very abrasive against, against that kind of context. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to create a, a a building that was strangely familiar, that had qualities of both the kind of common pitched roof and the landscape in which it was sited. So it's trying to rain, raise questions over its origin. Is something natural? Is it rock cut? Is it an assembly? Is it something synthetic? And where do those boundaries occur in the project? So as we get closer, we can see that it's an assembly of blocks with seams and material changes. And in this, I wanted to work with these parts. So the center of the, the building is, is comprised of two or three in situ cast pieces. And then it's surrounded by smaller ones that can be removed or added or taken away. And they all possess different material qualities, which means that they then age at different speeds. So they've got different porosities, things like that. And the house is sort of um, an assembly of, of slopes, but then slopes within the parts themselves. And the different textures and material qualities are designed to sort of welcome and augment the natural state, that somehow the white building would become stained even quicker. So you can see in two of the elevations, it retains its, its kind of pitch, which is a kind of indicator of domesticity somehow. But then in the two longer elevations, it has an openness to its profile, which somehow allows us to imagine that the future parts might be added or taken away to this structure. And you can begin to read the kind of different temporal qualities within the parts within the same assembly. Some are fresher and some are older. So the skin is designed as this like deeply textured area for non-humans and dirt and seeds to, to grasp on. And the geometry of the project is almost designed to make it unpaintable. So you could not keep painting this thing white. And then over time, it can only take on its natural state. So in the section, you can see that the loft is exclusively reserved for non-humans. So maybe this is like puffins or seagulls, probably. Then the, the human spaces on the inside, they're much more akin to a kind of rock cut architecture. And it gives a sense of this carved monolith that protects its inhabitants from the harsh coastal weather while providing views across the bay. So the project aims to really kind of move beyond the sweetness of current nature architecture dialogues. And instead, it considers the wider natural and atmospheric actors that, compromise, that comprise our environment and how they manifest in our buildings. Ultimately, it's attempting to move beyond an aesthetics of nature towards an aesthetics of ecology. So 
So the next project is called Printed Parts. This project were, um, was a collaboration with uh, Sandhelden, who are a German sand 3D printing company. And it was trying to explore the position that buildings and their elements should have the ability to be reused, reappropriated, or recycled into new elements. So 3D printing with sand, we've, we've got the ability to create parts, to install and use them, and then at the end, we can grind them back down for refabrication. But this was happening at a time where I was wanting to explore not only the qualities of the megalithic, but if the parts weren't ground down, because let's say that they'd, they'd become embodied with such amazing moss or, moss or patina, but could the parts then be reassembled in something that was more loose fit, something that was more playful, or something rather odd? So we can see here on the image on the right, this is Paros Fort in Greece, which is constructed from the kind of remains of a temple. So it's, it's not necessarily like Lego, but it has the potential for it to be, to be restacked. I also wanted to kind of explore these micro worlds um, that I'd been observing in all my kind of <laughs> walks outside during lockdown and how they have their own little worlds within these gaps and within the materials. Um, and this has all been created by this open cliff hypothesis through, through, the, through the moisture retention. So it has a packing logic where we can see that it's a space filling geometry. But what I wanted to do is to create agglomerated parts. So parts that can fit together in a kind of loose fit manner. So within this assembly, the legibility of the parts is entirely opaque. In this instance, all the seams are starting to form gentle slopes and pockets that run through the objects acting as fissures. I also wanted to kind of revisit the early promises of 3D printing and architecture. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to create high resolution bespoke parts every single time. And through procedural design systems, it's very, very easy for us to do that. The other thing that working with the parts and these procedural design systems is that you can really maximize file to fabrication limits. So every single part is maximizing the potential of the kind of fabrication to create intense intricacies and fissures that run through it. So we've started to make some of these. Um, and you can see that the parts in themselves, they aim for a kind of temporal ambiguity. Some areas are very sharp. Some areas are more eroded and striated. And within the part itself, it looks like it's comprised of smaller and smaller parts. So these operate and have value as individual elements within themselves, as well as within an overall assembly, perhaps creating worlds within worlds. And you can see in this close up that all the seams and the fissures and the textures with the moss, flora, and insects could begin to flourish. And if this object was left outside with the right orientation and wind direction, it would become overgrown very quickly. So here you can sort of see this animation just uh, moving past and around some of these assemblies, where the legibility of, of the parts has dissolved. And we get these kind of rock-like fissures cutting through all the elements. But we also have moments of kind of contemporary striation. And also the scale of these parts is akin to something from a more ancient time. And we can create that because we're 3D printing them. We can hollow those parts out and make them lightweight and, and, and sort of liftable. This is us just moving through the uh, inside. So there's this notion of a kind of column and beam from, from these uh, original megaliths. And sadly, this one hasn't left the factory, but we're hoping to get a section of this built uh, very soon. So the last section that I want to um, talk about is T4T Lab. 
And again, I'm, I'm kind of showing this because of the context uh, of being for grad school. Um, and this was a studio that I ran at Texas A&M with Gabe Esquivel, where he kind of invites people every year to, to run a studio. And what we did is we, we, we offered the students all the ideas and all the kind of notions that I've outlined here to see what kind of things they come up with. That's one of the good things about being a, a lecturer is that you can share your, you know, this kind of endeavor with, with, with others. The deep ground, but also thinking about the role of infrastructure in the city and how a lot of our infrastructure is hidden from our view. So there was also some challenges that the students really tried to attack in terms of like working with megaliths, working with textures, mass and aperture. So I wanted to focus on two, two projects in particular. The first project um, looks, looks to work with the vast, vast infrastructure in the undergrounds of our cities. And that something seemingly as simple as rain needs a large amount of engineering to stop our cities becoming inundated with water. <laughs> And, you know, if we speculate on the future of, of um, global warming, that these conditions are only going to become worse and worse, but we're entirely disconnected from it. And effectively, what these underground infrastructures do is they create and promote the conditions of a way. So we just flush the toilet and it's a way. We put our stuff in the bin and it's a way. It rains, the water goes down and it's a way. So it's something kind of akin to out of sight and out of mind. So with these students, what they wanted to do was they wanted to really like unground that condition. And they wanted to create a series of urban parks throughout New York that gathered all the water runoff and acoustically enhanced that sound of water to kind of allure people in. When they were designing these parks, they wanted to extrapolate the conditions of the holdout building to enter the site. So the holdout building is normally something that you see where it's a very small building pinned in with much larger developments. And that kind of alludes to the fact that it was there before. So for them, this was a tool to create the temporal ambiguity that, that you know, I'm talking about in the work. So that somehow this is something ancient, incredibly stained, and was somehow there even before the city in itself. So you enter into this kind of new public park through the holdout buildings on the street, and then you transverse the ground plane. And you're constantly being drawn further and further towards the sound of the water that's filling up the sewer. So even a light drizzle becomes a waterfall. And you can see that this access is then creating this new park that people would then inhabit. And the park is trying to get people to engage with a public space that it's not a park of nature, but it's a park of ecology. So it's really trying to highlight the relationship of the city to weather, in this instance, to rain. And that people can then transfer down into the sewers that, that maintain the kind of anthropocentrism of the city. Arguably. Um, the last project that I'm going to show today really looked to ask all these questions about ancientness, but it starts to ask these questions about the machine and metal and how we cognitize them and their role within this kind of Anthropocene in the creation of nature. So it attempts to question how do we cognitize seeing a large metallic structure in a central urban environment? And how would we think about it if it displayed its natural state? How would we question its use? How would we question its function? Would we see it as something toxic? Would we see it as something positive and working for us? Now, we've seen these kind of buildings before, but instead of fetishizing the machine and technology, it attempts to create this humbleness even our most advanced technology and our machines are not separate or above or beyond the effects of atmosphere. And they all exist the same as all other things within the biosphere. 
So the proposal is conceived and is an assembly of, of folded metal parts, some shiny, some brand new, others older and more degraded. And like the other project, it attempts to make visible the kind of the digging and the work and the, the things that exist within our cities. So somebody transverses through this, they might make visible plumbing and cables and all the other things that exist to, to maintain this anthropocentrism. And the ground is unformalized in the project and it's, ex it's exposed and it shows the effects of the metal structure on the ground and the effects of the ground on the metal structure. So we see rising rust as well as a toxicity starting to pool in the soils underneath the project. So in a way, it's, it's, it's trying to speak to, can a machine be ancient? Or can it have this temporal ambiguity as well? So it's trying to open up new, uh, a new dialogue and a new discussion. The ancientness is not just about rocks or lithic architecture, but we also have to consider all things within the biosphere that are made and how they are working within this kind of global ecology. And it's trying to promote ecocentric thoughts about the roles of machines in creating the environmental challenges that we face today. So I'm, all, I'm always really happy to receive emails and take questions. So if somebody wants to ask me something, you can, you can do that on, on these two things. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop there and say thank you very much. And hopefully now we can get into a bit of a discussion about these things because that's always a bit more interesting. So thank you. Thank you, Barry. That was wonderful. Um, I'd like to open it up now to, we actually have quite a few students joining us uh, today. So I'd like to offer them the opportunity to um, ask any questions, uh, certainly also to the, the faculty that are joining us. Um, Anyone has any thoughts or things they were thinking about during the presentation? Hey. Um, Hi. <laughs> I had a question. Great. So the project that you had for the Glasgow School of Art it actually looked like a temple or a cave from India. And like all your projects focus on architecture used to grow nature, or if I'm if I'm wrong, please correct me. But that's what I am taking it from it. So do you, like in any, the using materials that actually like are in nature, for example, the mushroom brick that is recently in articles that build. So are the materials also like part of nature or are there regular materials that you use and then those materials become nature later? Yeah, I think, no, it's a really good question. And thanks so much for, for asking. Um, I, think, I think that um, in a lot of the work, a kind of material is implied, but isn't super specific. And the reason that I, I try to not get too specific about materials is because I think a lot of times that when you really start to think about materials, you can get bogged down in the kind of construction and fabrication questions. And what a lot of the work that I'm trying to do is to really push like a kind of aesthetic conversation. So I haven't really, and a lot of the stuff that I've shown today, I haven't thought about that. But if you remember at the start, um, I showed that I do work with a lot of material research on the Bartlett B Pro course. And one of the things that we're actually thinking about there is to say, well, maybe what we need to do now is to have some materials that should last a very long time. And we should have some materials that should last a very short time and not try and have one size fits all. So, for example, if we conceive the building as a series of parts, what we could do is we could have some parts. And if it was constantly designed to be replaced, then it wouldn't have the same kind of arduous requirements to meet those of structure or thermal envelope. So, for me, things like mycelium, bioplastics, I definitely think they have a place in the future of architecture, but nobody wants to build their building every single year. <laughs> it's just, it, would be, it would be too much. So it has to somehow be a, an approach where we have both. 
for very long lasting things like stone. And we also have materials that can maybe last for one year or five years and then be replaced. But if something's going to be replaced every year or every five years, then it has to be at worst biodegradable and at best biocontributing. So that's how I would kind of try and answer that one. So thanks so much for the question. Thank you. Anyone else have a question? Well, if the students don't have another question, maybe I can ask a question. Hi, Barry. Thank Hi, you for Captain. the amer amazing talk. The work is so spectacularly beautiful. Um, and I, I really was enjoying the way you were bringing together this idea of ancientness and aesthetics. Um, because I think ancientness in a way kind of predates aesthetics and the, what, what we kind of understand aesthetics to be. Um, and I'm thinking about sort of like classical beauty um, in describing ancientness, but you're starting, you're, you're kind of bringing these two things together. And I wonder if you can kind of touch upon what, um, what are the contemporary ways of thinking about um, ancientness um, today. And I think it's, I mean, a lot of the work that you're showing is really sort of um, um, advanced um, in methodology and software and technology. And I wondered if you could touch upon that a little bit. Yeah. Um, thanks. Thanks so much for the, the question. Um, I think, I think the, for me, the kind of contemporary way to think about ancientness and is to think about it within the context of ecology. And what, what I mean by that is that these buildings are not ancient. <laughs> There's no such thing as kind of ancient architecture. You know, we as humans have only existed for this kind of sliver and made buildings from this sliver. But I think that there's something in the power of those types of structures that really resonates with us. And this is what I was trying to sort of like tease out. And when we see ancient architecture, we, it's, very, it's very destabilizing and it's very humbling. And I think for me, the, the power of ancientness is not like, I really want to kind of stay away from a kind of romanticism, uh, you know, nostalgia about the past and the good old days. It's, it's not really about that. Like, in a way, what I'm saying is that these buildings are, are like not ancient. It's just, they're all contemporary structures, but they're just allowed to display their natural state or we accept the display of their natural state. So I'm not trying to argue that all buildings should be ancient, but what I'm trying to argue is that some of the qualities of those structures um, could act as a bridge for us, where we could bring in more conditions of degradation and sort of colonization by plants and weeds and insects uh, into a contemporary built environment. So I don't know if that really answers the, the first part of the question, but this is kind of what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to argue for. The second thing in terms of the methodology and, and the computation, um, I mean, I always, <laughs> I invest a lot of time in the background, like working with tools, but in a way I'm, I'm desperate to almost never talk about them. Because I think that you know, subsequent generations have at a point had a series of tools which has allowed them to produce particular effects. And you know, somebody will come along in five years and blow this stuff out of the water in, in a totally, totally new way. I think, I think we're kind of already seeing that. So for me, it's, it's, I'm more interested to talk about the effects and the things that I'm trying to create. But what we have now, which I, didn't, I don't think we've had before, is the ability to really manipulate geometries to, to almost create these kind of like micro details um, that just wasn't possible with other kind of larger mesh modeling. And I think that because we can create these micro details, I think we can move past the kind of smoothness of the digital project to something that is like highly um, articulated and crafted and rich. I mean, I don't like the word crafted, but maybe, maybe you understand what I mean. So, I'm really trying to use the tools to kind of progress past the, the kind of surface project of the of the digital towards 
creating surfaces that would propagate forms of growth. That makes sense. It's always so funny on Zoom because you, you think you finish and <laughs> no, no one's the case. Yeah, I, 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 I hear you and I see you, Barry. I, I agree that sometimes you answer the question, you're like, is that, is that done? Okay. One that I could finish out with, but I'd love to have a student ask if, if they have one instead. I have one more question. Oh, great. Um, thank you so much, Barry. Incredible work and presentation. And I have a question regarding the aesthetics of your projects, uh, which you call them biospatial design. There is always like more than one color in nature, like a hybrid mix, but your work is mostly monocolor. And obviously your work reflects some computational design aesthetics and texturing using like new emerging technologies like software. How do you think um, fabrication and real life materials and objects are affecting your style and your representation and qualities that you are showing? Thanks. Thanks so much for the question. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> they are they are quite monochrome uh, in some ways, and I think that what I'm really interested in is to sort of like produce the artifact and then have the coloration emerge from staining, moss, weather, atmosphere, moulds that that somehow that that those kind of patina is not always like designed by me that somehow like the greens or the oranges that might emerge comes comes from those kind of conditions i do in terms of the the fabrication and the materials um i think that it depends how far in the future you kind of want to cite the work for me right now i know that in the near future we could we could we can 3d print stone. We can do that either through binders or we can do it through actually centering stone to make pieces. That doesn't mean that in your lifetime and my lifetime that we won't have the technology to build much more like synthetic, optimised multi-material pieces. But for right now, what I'm trying to do is I think because I'm trying to really tie into this kind of primitiveness in the work that, the, that a block or an object or a part is made of one thing. And then it's stacked on top of another thing. So that's something that's quite that's quite intentional with the way that I'm with the way that I'm working, if that makes sense. But thanks so much for the question. Thank thanks, you. Brock. Uh, Christy says I can ask a question uh, from across the office here. Uh, very great, great lecture. Um, I'm really interested, you used the word pastiche at one point, you know, the, this idea of kind of appropriating and, and using something until it loses meaning. Well, I'm actually kind of interested in how you're utilizing that and maybe two specific instances I saw. Uh, one where you're talking about appropriating this kind of um, these small, um, if they're, they're geological formation, surface area of re reactivity and this kind of micro detailing. But there's also kind of a nihilism there of like saying the, the appropriated geological object is in many ways operating the same as the hatch. And I'm wondering how you make a decision about, you know, where you begin to appropriate from these different areas and um, adding this layer to the work and kind of reconstituting its value. Thanks, Casey. I thought you were going to do that in a Scottish accent. Um, but uh, so, I mean, to be honest, like the, the grotto facade, I'll never do anything with that ever again. <laughs> so like that one, that one, like probably I just ignore. But I think that there's a, there's, a, there's a weird territory with all this stuff. And there's also an obsession with rocks right now that I think is like a bit dangerous that you create like fake rocks or fake ruins. And I think that you can, you can be suggestive and you can kind of work with things like, you, know, you call it a graphic hatch, but I would maybe call it like emerging striations that you might see within a rock kind of composite that, that it has a kind of notion of like, let's call it like digitized sediments, something like this. And I think that there's definitely a sweet spot to be found in this. 
And there's also something about a kind of, um, there's actually something that came up in one of the t for t reviews about authenticity. And I think that one of the dangers uh, of this work is, is in its authenticity. So as I kind of move through the, the, the kind of newer stages of the work, I'm never ever, ever trying to make it look like anything biological. I'm trying to make them look like artifacts that might have conditions or pieces or qualities that are somehow touching or brushing against things, but are not literal or direct translations or like kind of pastiches of quote unquote nature or natural objects. So that's the kind of like part of the journey is to be, is to really move away from all biological models to ones that are clearly like kind of like, let's say artifactual design. So I don't know if that answers the question, but uh, that's how I would, can I respond to that? Great, thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Barry. Uh, thank you for all the questions for the faculty that joined today and the students. Um, we we look forward, we wish we could now host you here in Los Angeles. So that's the only bad part about um, you were able to get here so quickly to join us, but we wish we could extend um, a more hospitable afternoon for you here, but hopefully in the near future. Um, so thank you on behalf of all of us for joining today. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, again very soon. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Thank you, Barry. Thank, thank you, Barry. Bye.